Well, thank you for being in worship with us today as we continue on in our sermon series on Joyful. And today, you're looking at the cornerstone of joy as we look really at one of the most important passages in the Bible, Second Philippians, uh, and really the Christ hymn there and the importance of that, the significance of that for understanding who Jesus was. And really, he's the cornerstone of the joy that's in our lives through him. Uh, and I also just want to lift up that uh, November the 14th is Commitment Sunday. Uh, you, if you, should, you should have received a commitment card and a self-addressed return envelope, stamped envelope in the mail. Uh, and it looks something like this. And uh, you can either send that back to the church by mail. Or you can go online to umcgs.org. And just under the Give button, you'll see 2022 Commitment Card. And you can do it electronically. Uh, and also, of course, you could bring it here to the church and bring it into the worship service if you'd like as well and, and put it into one of our offering boxes. But it's really important because it underwrites the ministry of the gospel through Good Shepherd in so many different ways, in so many ways that our church impacts not only the community but the world uh, as well as ministering to the gospel to the people that are, are part of the extended church family. So I want to encourage you to fill out one of those uh, 2022 commitment cards and get it back to the church. With that, let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your presence in our lives this day. We give you thanks that your spirit is with us wherever we might be. Open our hearts and minds to what you wish to say to us today. How we can follow that and the power that you want to give us to do and to enable us to do what you will. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles out his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Hedge to age he stands and time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end When God at three in one The Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. And name above all names. Worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God. our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God, how great how great is our God.
Well, thank you for being with us today as we continue on in this sermon series on joyful and today looking at the cornerstone of, genero- of generosity and joy and contentment in our lives, which is, well, my friends, it's Jesus Christ. And as I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded of this, and getting ready for this particular sermon, I was reminded of something that happened to me and my wife uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we were out in Zion National Park, and we were driving, uh, in, we were getting into these buses. There are little buses that they, they you know, take you up the canyon now, uh, and these are like a, a compressed natural gas-powered buses. And they're not, not very big. They're, they're maybe a little bit bigger than the school bus, maybe. Uh, and so we're, we go up and we get into one of these things and we're driving up the canyon and we get to one of the stops there and uh, there were some uh, Japanese tourists that it were there. Now, I, I haven't been around a lot of Japanese in my life, so I don't know a lot about the, about the folks there. Uh, and so these Japanese tourists, they started coming on and they started coming on and they kept coming on and they kept coming on and, and you know, uh, we get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter in that little bus. Uh, and finally we get so tight, I mean, it's just literally like you're just, can't, it's, you know, kind of in there like sardines. And I'm thinking, man, they are in my space, you know. And I started counting, and I counted 95 people on that little bus. Uh, and we were like in there crammed in. Now, now that, that gave me some perspective on a story that I read this week. It's a true story about something that happens in Tokyo. Tokyo, Japan is one of the most pop- densely populated cities in the world. Uh, and there are 14, over 14 million people that actually live there. And so you can imagine they can't have spaced out housing, single family units like we have here. And so what they do is they build up in order to get high rise kind of skyscraper apartments. Uh, and they had a little problem going on because they would get these new buildings, these towers, uh, and they would go up and adjacent to, a, you know, a much shorter, older building. And the big, tall towers would block the sun off of the older buildings. And that was kind of important because it uh, created kind of a dark environment in the little shorter buildings. And it also was colder in those buildings because they used the sun hitting the side of the building in order to generate heat in the buildings a lot of the time. And so they developed an interesting concept. It's called Nishokin. Uh, and Nishokin is, uh, they, if you were to translate it into English, it would be the right of sunshine. Uh, and that everybody had a certain right of sunshine that was supposed to be uh, allowed into their lives. And so any of these builders, there was a law that any of these builders that made these high-rise you know, skyscraper apartments, uh, if they robbed the sunshine off of another building, what they had to do is they had a, they had a formula that they developed for a one-time payment to the people who were residents of the other building for each hour that they would lose the sun on a winter day. Uh, And so they'd make this one-time payment in order to just, well, to try and compensate them for the loss of sunshine in their lives. Now, I thought this week, you know, uh, that that nishokun would, uh, uh, you could use that in other areas of life because a lot of times what we do is we build our lives in someone else's sunshine. Or we build our lives at the expense of other people's lives. Uh, and I know a lot of times we think, well, that's just the way that the world is or the way the world operates. But, but the reality is there is a different way. And Paul, uh, the apostle, gives witness to a very, very different way than, you know, the way of kind of we block out other people's sunshine. Uh, now, understand, Paul understood what this, the way of the world was. Uh, and so that's why he says uh, in different parts of that second chapter of Philippians that we've been looking at over the last few weeks, he says he was talking about, first of all, selfish ambition and conceit. Certainly a way to block the sunshine out of other people's lives. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded of the college football playoff rankings, you know, and who's number one and people around here, you know, getting interested in that because Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are in the top ten, uh, you know, and whose team is better than who. You know, we understand selfish ambition. Uh, and we understand how conceit sometimes plays in, say, sports, but also into many areas of our lives. Or he also lifts up a murmuring and arguing as just kind of an indication of how the world operates. Uh, And certainly as he was writing that, he was probably thinking about Moses and the Israelites and how the the Israelites grumbled and complained with Moses, you know, and Moses did this and Moses didn't do that. And we just ought to go back to Egypt, Moses, and all that kind of stuff. And so he understood, Paul understood the ways of the world. But he also understood that there was a different way. It's Jesus' way. And he says there's a struggle between these two ways of dealing with and understanding the world, kind of different frames of mind, if you will. Uh, And there's a place where that struggle takes place uh, that's really important in the Christian life, and that is the battle that takes place in the mind. 
Now, um, so Paul is writing Philippians. He's writing in this second chapter, and he says, okay, so now I want you to make my joy complete. He says, I've got joy uh, because of the things that you've done and helping me in the ministry and your generosity and so on and so forth, and, uh, but I want you to make my joy complete. And he says, this is what I want you to do, and you'll see these quotes there. Uh, he says, be of the same mind, and then a few words later he says, being of one mind. Uh, now, i got to tell you that that word that gets translated into English, mind, uh, is kind of an interesting word. I was looking at that in the Greek this week. And it's a, it's a word that if you translate it, I guess I would translate it uh, as a frame of mind or a frame of, of thought or will that is at the core of a person. Not, not superficial, but it's a frame of mind that is at the core of the person, who that person is. And he continues on just a little bit later in this second chapter, and he says this, let the same mind be in you. Okay, what mind is that? The mind that was in Christ Jesus. And he says, we need, as Christians, we need to have that frame of mind, that frame of thought and of will that was in Jesus. Uh, and he continues on, actually, later on in, the, in this epistle, he'll write this, and he'll say, the peace of God will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. He says, it's just that important. So he's talking about we've got a battle that's going on, and it's related to how Jesus dealt with life and understood life and uh, con contrasted to the way that the world generally operates. And so where's the core of real life? Where's the core of joy is the question that he's really asking us in this second chapter of Philippians. And he goes about it in kind of an interesting way. Uh, and you'll see there it's all about Jesus. With him, that's certainly the case. It's all about Jesus. And he says, okay, so... Here it is. Uh, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. And he's, he, he's talking about, the hum, about humility and how important humility is in the spiritual life. Now, I need to say, kind of, red, well, you know, kind of wave a red flag with this, uh, and you'll see it there on your screen. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not kind of running down yourself. Humility is thinking of others instead and acting in their best interest at times instead of your own. In other words, I, I'm, I'm going to put somebody else first because I value them. And Paul says that is about, at the core, it's about Jesus. And it's about Jesus' humility. And now how do I have that same frame of mind uh, in, in my life as well? Well, <clears throat> let me suggest a couple of things here. Uh, you'll see... Uh, the way of humility. Now, now I want to just read this for you. It's a pretty lengthy little scripture passage here, but it's an extremely important one uh, because this is really, what this is is really uh, the earliest Christian hymn that he's quoting here. And so these people that he's writing to, these Jesus followers in Philippi, or if he's writing to the, the Jesus followers in Corinth or the Jesus followers in Rome or wherever, they would know this hymn. And it's like this. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, and here goes the hymn, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Now, that word exploited can also be translated clinged to or grasped. But emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Now, that literally in the Greek, that's the word doulos, and it's either a servant, it could be translated servant or slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he, what did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so, so why did he do that? What was Jesus' frame of mind that he would do that? Well, because he was serving your interest and my interest. And in human likeness, he was serving the, the will of his heavenly Father. And that was to, to sacrifice himself for us in order to free us, in order to extend forgiveness to you and me for all the, the difficulties and the problems and the struggles and the mistakes that we've made in our life and also to extend new life to us. A new life that is we're in a relationship not only with God but, but we're working on and by God's grace and God's spirit we're working on our relationships with other people to, to make those more positive if at all possible depending upon us he says. And so okay so how do I apply that to my life that way of humility? Let me suggest some things. First of all is in what Paul is talking about, he says, humility gives preference to others. He also talks about that in Romans 12. You see that quote there, give preference to one another in honor. In other words, I'm honoring somebody by giving preference to them as Jesus would. You know, <clears throat> as I was thinking about that this week, 
Uh, there was a couple of things that happened that made me think about this particular passage. One was there's a Jesus follower that's uh, been a uh, long time related here to this church and uh, uh, part of their extended church family. And this, this uh, particular Jesus follower uh, found that there was this person who was in need and uh, this person doesn't have much, okay? They don't have much. But they knew that this person had need, and so what they did, they took of their own, and probably more than they should have given, and they bought a $100 gift card and gave it to that person who, to give to that person who was in need. That's the kind of preference giving that he's talking about there. Now, I even saw it on, in the community this week. Uh, you know, there's the, the Mustang uh, High School Band was going to go to Indianapolis uh, for the competition up there, uh, and the bus company bailed on them at the last moment. They were supposed to have had seven charter buses to go up to Indianapolis, uh, and man, you know what they were going to, what were they going to do? Were they just going to lose the whole deal, and all those kids were going to be disappointed, and so on and so forth, and, and guess what? The people in the community and the people in the area came together. The Middell School System, the Yukon Public School System helped them out. There was a list of schools and companies and organizations and persons that helped them out, and what were they doing? They were giving preference to these kids in order to, to help them and to bless their lives. Humility, yes, that's being humble before God, but it's also giving preference to others the way Jesus gave preference to us in what he did for us on the cross. Now, there's a second thing about humility, that kind of humility that Jesus had. And that is humility is generous, is generous. You see what Jesus says there, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, to give his life for us. What was Jesus? His freedom of mind. Well, it was to serve, it was to give of himself for other people, uh, and it was to love, and as I said last week, you can spell love, G-I-V-E, that, that was the mind of Christ. Uh, and so why would he do that? Okay, so I want to just uh, point to a little, a little passage from Hebrews, the Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, where he says this, look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Okay, so what was Jesus' motive in sacrificing himself for us? His motivation, well, you could say, yes, he was obedient to his heavenly father. And yes, you could certainly say love, uh, love towards God and love towards us. And yes, you could certainly say generosity, but it was also joy, joy. The joy of seeing someone else made whole. The joy of seeing relationships restored with his heavenly father. The joy of seeing life restored. There is a deep generosity within humility, the kind of humility of Jesus and the kind of humility that Paul is calling us as followers of Jesus to have. And it's based on the joy of the influence that we can have in other people's life in his name. Humility is generous. Now, there's uh, something that happened out of that, and you'll see there... The consequences, Jesus is lifted up. You see, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He says, okay, so he left eternity. He takes upon himself our human nature. He humbles himself in obedience even to death on a cross for us and, and in obedience to his heavenly Father in that human likeness. Uh, and guess what? As he humbles himself, God lifts him up, it says. God exalts him and gives him a name that is above every name. And at the end, every name, every person, every knee will bend. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Lord, not because of his power, but because of his humility and his sacrifice. Okay, so how does that apply to us? Well, first of all, let me just say that there's a generous power that's given to us for new life. Uh, as Paul continues there, you'll see that quote, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if I were to translate that, I would translate it awe and humility. Awe before God, humility before God in the way that we live. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So how is this going to work? And he says, well, this is not going to work on your power. It's not going to work on my power. It's only going to work on, it's only going to work on God's power. And so we come to God 
with a sense of awe before him for his grace and for his love for us and his son. And we come before God as we humble ourselves before him and we trust in his work in us through his spirit. And, uh, you know, we trust him to guide us in this life. And to be with us through all of the struggles and difficulties we're going to face. I, I was reading a few weeks ago, uh, I was reading a story out of the uh, third century. Uh, and this guy who, he's, one day he was down on his knees and he was praying to God. And he was asking him to God, he says, you know, there's so many traps and so many faults and so many problems we can get stuck in. So many ways that we can be deceived. Uh, and so how can, how can anybody ever make it through all that and obtain salvation? And... Just as soon as he says that, he says, I heard the word humility. Humility gets us through that. Not our strength, not our wisdom on ourselves, not our knowledge, not our will. Humility before God. Humility in our relationships with other people. I surrender to his spirit working in me. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not about your power. It's not about my power. It's about him. Humility means also that I have to surrender my plans to God. <clears throat> you see that quote from James 4. Uh, God opposes everyone who is proud, but he gives grace to who? To everyone who is humble. So, says James, surrender to God. Now, I'll, let me just give you an example. Uh, let's say you feel uh, that God is speaking to you in some way or God. You kind of feel led to do something. You feel led to give up something or you feel led to take on some task or, or maybe to speak a good word to somebody or to help somebody who is in need or, or to give up yourself in some way. Uh, and the question is, will you humble yourself and will I humble myself enough to stop thinking about my plans or your plans and start saying yes to God's plans. And in fact, there's, there's a prayer for that, really, in the Scripture. You'll find it in Psalm 119. If, if, uh, there's an interesting translation of that. And this is the kind of a prayer that I think is appropriate in these kind of situations where we pray to God simply this, turn me away from wanting any other plan than yours. I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to ask for you to help me Turn me away from any other thing, any other plan, any other direction than yours. And why is that important? Well, Psalm 37 lifts it up and it says this. All who humble themselves before the Lord shall be given every blessing and shall have wonderful peace. I, I, you know, I just described that as everyone who humbles themselves before the Lord will have joy. They'll have joy in their lives. Okay, so, so what's the benefits of doing that? Well, again, going back to uh, second, uh, ch the second chapter of Philippians, uh, Paul lists some generous benefits if we, if we have the mind of Christ among us and if we, we follow that frame of mind in our lives. And he says the generous benefits, as he lists them off, just in that first verse, are and there's going to be encouragement. That is, say, God placing a sense of encouragement, a spirit of, of driving out, a, a spirit of fear within us, but giving us a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. There's going to be a sharing in that spirit, not only in our own lives, but between us uh, as we live with other Christians and as we walk with them and, and serve with them. Uh, there are going to be gentle words based in love. I would, I would translate it that way in what he's saying there. Gentle words based in love from God for us and the way that we speak to each other. And then also he says if there's any kindness or favor in, in, uh, in Christ, we'll receive that as well. Now, you know, that, that's a pretty good amount of benefits, isn't it? Encouragement, sharing in the spirit, gentleness of words based in love, kindness and favor. But the only other way that we can get to that is by humbling ourselves before the Lord and following him in the same way that Jesus did. And trusting that we can do that not based on our own power, but on the power that God will give us as he, as he works in us. So uh, just to, just to kind of sum up here, uh, some questions here for you and I as we think about this particular passage, and I, and I really do suggest that you go back and just slowly read through this uh, second, uh, second part of Philippians, second chapter of Philippians, the first 11 verses there. Uh, and the question is simply this, how about, am I taking other sunshine? Am I taking other people's sunshine out of their lives by my selfish ambition or conceit, my murmuring or arguing? 
Do you see that in your life in some way? Uh, uh, how about this? Is it all about my interests or is it about the interests of others? Am I, am I looking at other people in the way that Jesus would? Or if I had the mind of Christ, if you had the mind of Christ, what would I have to change in my life? What would you have to change in your life this week? If you're going to shift to his way, his framework of thinking. And then finally there, where or to whom can I reflect the generosity of Jesus? That generosity that he had in giving himself for me. Where could I reflect that or to whom could I reflect that in my life? Who would that be in your life? Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your grace and goodness in our lives. And we give you thanks for the, the way that your son was so, so gracious and so generous towards us. Wanting to give himself completely for us. As the song goes, he gave his life. What, else, what more could he give? Help us. Help us to have that frame of mind that was in Christ. Help us to love others generously. Help us to steer clear of selfish ambition and conceit and murmuring and arguing. And instead to have that will, that, that, that mind, that thought of Christ. Where we follow that and humble ourselves before you. And have humility in our relationships with others. Help us to find joy. The joy you want to give us in our lives. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being a part of our worship this day. And uh, I just want to encourage you for a couple of things. The first of all is that to make sure and uh, think about your worship offerings, giving those online or giving them by mail. Uh, at, because it is such a, it's a privilege of ours to, to give our offerings to the Lord just as an expression of gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God does for us in our lives and for the many ways that he blesses us, not only in his son, but also just in the, in the gift of life itself. I uh, also want to just uh, lift up again, our Commitment Sunday is on November the 14th, uh, and you should have probably received in the mail, many of you, uh, this 2022 commitment card, uh, and uh, a way to send it back would be to put it in the envelope that you received, the self-addressed stamped envelope, return envelope to the church. You can do it that way. You can also go online to umcgs.org and click the 2022 commitment card button that's just under the give button, uh, and it will send you to the electronic version of that commitment card. And of course, you can bring it back in worship uh, over the next few weeks as well. Uh, that's going to be available to you. Uh, I just want to also lift up that, yes, uh, Advent is coming, Christmas is heading our direction, uh, and so on November the 21st, we're going to do the Hanging of the Greens uh, service, and we're going to be re decorating the church that evening, uh, and uh, so I want to make sure that you'll be there for the Hanging of the Greens service at 6 p.m., and then afterwards, we're going to have a, a soup dinner uh, down in our Christian Life Center uh, as we continue on, so th that'll be a fun evening and a place for you to gather together for not only worship, but also fellowship. Uh, as we, we start the Christmas season, uh, uh, really by putting up those uh, greens on the 21st. And then Advent, it, the first Sunday of Advent is actually uh, November the 28th, the Sunday thereafter uh, Thanksgiving. So I want to encourage you to be part of worship for that uh, as we move towards Christmas. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But it is coming. And, and, and thank God and, and to joy to the world that's coming to us. With that, uh, I want to invite you to uh, bow your head and pray with me as we conclude. Lord, we give you thanks that you're with us in this day. We'd ask that you send us out now with your blessing, with your peace, with your joy. Help us that we might have the mind of your son Jesus in this week. Help us that we might relate to you in the way that he did and also to relate to others in a way that will not only bring joy to their lives but joy to ours. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen.